Okay, I wonder if you can relate to this. So I open up my terminal and uh, here we are. It's a nice terminal. I'm using Ghosty, right? And then I go to a project and I open it up in NeoVim and all of a sudden I'm extremely frustrated because I see three different colors here. Rather, I should say I see three different color palettes here. I see my NeoVim color palette, which is not the same as my terminals uh, color palette, which is not the same as my desktop wallpapers color palette. There's three different color palettes and that bothers me. Probably this is a form of mental illness, but maybe you can relate. Okay, so it's easy to fix uh, the terminal and NeoVim. So first I'll, I'll just go into Ghosty and uh, I'm gonna fix the terminal, right? So I'm gonna put in my favorite color scheme these days, which is called Kanagawa Paper, which I quite like. And uh, I'm gonna do the same thing in NeoVim. I'm gonna put this one back. Okay, great. Okay, and now if I, if I go back to that uh, directory before and look, I've got a nice terminal that matches my NeoVim color scheme. I really like it, okay? What a beautiful color scheme. But the problem is this wallpaper still doesn't match. You can see, it doesn't match. And so that's why I made Milank. So I've got it hosted on my website, um, but uh, we'll talk about how you could host this yourself or make your own version, it's very easy. Uh, so I upload an image. I'll do it from my downloads folder. This is the image I'm using here. I really like this image. You can get this at uh, Basic Apple Guy. He's got a bunch of amazing wallpapers. Uh, anyway, I think these are great. So that's a nice image. But again, it doesn't match my color scheme. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose Kanagawa Paper. It's going to go ahead and make it Kanagawa Paper. Great. And then I can download that one and make that my wallpaper. Okay, and now when I switch this over, you can see everything matches perfectly. Again, maybe that's mental illness. I don't know. Most people don't care. Most great developers do not care about this. I care about this for some reason. All right, and this entire app is like 600 lines of JavaScript all done in the browser. There's no server uh, except for, you know, sending over the JavaScript. And uh, if you're interested in learning how this works, keep watching. Okay, let's see how this actually works. So I've got an index.html. Uh, the only important part here is that I'm uh, importing the script and then I'm giving it a div in which to host it. And that's it. So if I run this thing right here, uh, there we are. Okay, so this is on localhost again. And then I can upload an image. Uh, let's do the same one as before. Okay, and then I can choose, uh, let's let's do something else. Let's do rose pine. There we are. Okay, and then look at this. Okay, very nice. So I've tried to include, you know, a lot of very popular color schemes. Uh, you know, what, what's a very, very popular one is Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Night. There we are. This is what Tokyo Night looks like. Right? Or Capuchin is another very popular one. Let's do Mocha. It's going to look like Tokyo Night because they're almost the same, very similar. Uh, but again, all these colors here match the colors in the Tokyo Night or Capuchin or Rose Pine or whatever uh, color scheme. Okay, so let's get into how something like this could even work, uh, especially just in the browser and so few lines of code. So the first thing we're doing is uh, when we upload an image, we are just loading that into an HTML5 canvas. So uh, there we go. It's now loaded into the browser into an HTML5 canvas, which means I have access to all the pixels. So how many pixels are in this image? That's a good question. So let's go to our downloads and let's take a look and uh, let's run file on the OG wall. That's what I called it here. And it's going to tell us this is the, uh, the number of pixels. Okay, so doing some quick math here, it looks like there's around 23 million pixels, which is a lot of pixels. And what we're going to do for every single pixel is we're going to take a look at the pixel and we're going to figure out what color in the color scheme is this closest to. Okay, and how are we going to do that? Okay, so if you look over here, I've got a RGB color code chart. If I click on any one of these boxes, right, I'm going to see the red, green, blue, right? Now, now when you're working in the browser, you're often working in uh, hex values, right? So you'll see like FA or 03 or something like that. But uh, here, you know, we're, we're using up to 255, which is the same thing, right? It's just a decimal instead of hexadecimal. All right, so if I can click on any one of these and figure out the location of it, then I can treat it like a point in 3D space. Okay, here we are. And then I can find the distance from these points, right? So every color has a certain distance to another uh, color. Does that make sense? Uh, given a pixel, right? So I'm going to go through all the pixels. We'll talk about that in a second. But given a pixel, find it. Okay, we're going to put it, get its color code. And then we're going to find out which color in the NeoVim color scheme is closest, right? And again, a 3D space. So we're just figuring out the distance. Whichever one's closest, we're just going to switch it to that color. But again, I, I said that there were 24 million, right? So how can I possibly uh, do 24 million that quickly? Well, here's the other thing that I find kind of cool. So I was unaware because I'd never used it before, never needed to. Uh, Navigator has something called hardware concurrency, 
And if we look it up, and what this does is it's gonna tell you a number between one and the number of logical processors potentially available to your user agent. So how many processors do I have available? So instead of a single processor having to deal with every single pixel throughout this entire thing, we can split it up given the number of processors. Now, it doesn't tell you exactly the right number, right? But it, it'll, it'll be close enough. It'll be more than one, which is good. Uh, and, and it'll be useful. So what I do is at the very start, I just check how many processors do I have available to me? How many processors can I take and divide this work up again so that they can all do their own job and then when it's complete, I'll just put it all together. Okay, so as an example here, I'm just gonna hard code the number of workers to one. So instead of using all the processors that are available on my computer, I'm going to just use a single one. So I'm gonna load up this 20, uh, what do we say, 23 million pixel thing and I'm going to Try and put it in beautiful Kanagawa paper. We're gonna wait, we're gonna wait, we're gonna wait, and it's gonna take a lot longer because it's a single processor, right, uh, doing all of the work. Oh, and in case you're wondering, the reason I'm doing uh, minus one here is because I don't wanna block the, the main execution thread. I don't want it to become unresponsive. Okay, so let's get rid of that, and then we'll just do it again one more time just to, to compare, right? So, uh, you know, again, beautiful Kanagawa paper. It's much faster when you have a lot of uh, processors to work with. All right, the rest of this code is just JavaScript. Again, I'm not using a framework. The, the nice thing is you can just drop this into any page and just have a div called milink and it's gonna work. But there's, there's a little bit of cool stuff here. So if you split up the work amongst the processors, now you're thinking, okay, well then you need communication against the processors. What, do you have like a channel? Do you have threads? How does it work? Well, what you do is you, you just pass messages between them. And so the data, sorry, not the data, the the, uh, the memory is, is not shared, right? So you, you're, telling it, here's some, here's some information, go do some work on this, here's some data, and then, and then give me back some data, right? But we're not, we're not sharing memory. So you can't, you know, you're not, you can't impact my, my array. I can't impact your array. We can't change the values of each other's variables. Um, but I can give you a lot of work to do at once. So long as that work is totally independent of my work. And luckily in this case, the way that this works is it is entirely independent, right? Every pixel can be calculated in isolation. You don't need to know about the neighboring pixel, at least the, the naive implementation that I've done. So what I do is I have a worker function, which I uh, cast into a string and then execute in a new worker, right? Uh, and then if you look at the worker function, this is where it actually does the work of comparing everything, right? And saying, okay, this color, this pixel right here is this color. Actually, I've already gotten all the colors. So here, here's what color it should be. Great, boom, let's, let's find the closest one. Let's go and do 7 million of these, right? But they can all be done independently. And then earlier when I said, okay, but so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the, like the hex codes like this RGB, uh, it's not actually true. So that's initially how I had done it. Uh, but then the results weren't as good. And I realized that just because uh, two numbers are close to each other, it doesn't actually mean that they look that similar. Okay, so what I'm using instead of RGB is something called OKLCH, which the browser supports. Uh, and it's very similar. The difference between the numbers is perceptually closer. So like a smaller difference is also like a human eye would say, yes, these two numbers seem similar. And here, here they have some graphs about this, which honestly, like it's, it's out of my depth. I don't really understand it, but it is true that I got better results when I switched over to OKLCH, OK, but it's not perfect, right? So, so it is a naive implementation. I'm gonna show you another example. So here's a nice uh, wintry theme. So it's snow, right? And then I'm gonna put this into, uh, let's, let's do Groovebox, Grubbox, Groovebox. And uh, there we are, Groovebox, and, and take a look at this. So what you're seeing here is, again, I'm only using the color scheme, uh, the colors available in the Groovebox color scheme, Groovebox Dark. So um, if there is no color that is like uh, in between these two, you're gonna get this, I guess they call it posterization is the term. Again, I'm not a designer, I don't know. So you get this sort of unnatural thing. Now, sometimes it kind of looks cool, and I think it looks cooler for certain color schemes than others. Right, like with cappuccino, I don't think it's too bad. Uh, maybe macchiato is better. Maybe frappe is better. There we are. I don't think it looks too bad, but you know, it's not perfect. And so I'm sure there are better ways of doing this, but I don't know them and don't really care about them. And for my use case of just wanting to take a an image and make it look like this, yeah, this works fine. That's good enough for me. So yeah, again, back to the, the one hosted on my website. So again, I'm gonna take an image. Uh, let's take that snow again. And uh, it's kind of cool, right? Just uh, the idea that, okay, I'm gonna choose a color scheme. We're gonna go through ac across every single pixel. We're gonna find the closest one and then we're gonna give you a new image that you can download. We're gonna do it to you in like a couple seconds. Like, I don't know, computers are cool. I think that that's pretty cool. And this one's way faster because it's a smaller image, right? Whereas the, the other image uh, was a lot bigger, right? More pixels. So uh, this one takes 
a little bit longer. I've got this hosted on my GitHub so you can take a look right here, Starry Night being converted. Uh, and also, again, it's it's really not a big file, right? Most of this, so I've got a little bit of code here, but then most of it is just color schemes, you know, so your, your favorite color scheme may be there if you're interested in that. Okay, cool.